Part 2. As the clamor from outside filtered into the private room, the hand working on a weapon paused, and a pair of ears pricked up. There was the sound of fighting, people running, and some screams mixed in. They had been attacked but there was still no idea of the attackers' numbers and their abilities. This was in spite of being trained to loudly shout that information when an attack came. He could still hear something. This might have been a private room, but it was within a cave and had only a curtain in place of a door. The only thing separating this place from the entrance was distance, and while the curtain was thick, sound could still get in. There were close to 70 people in the mercenary band known as the Death Spreading Brigade. They were not as strong as him, but they were still grizzled veterans. A raid by a small number of men would not cause such chaos. With that in mind, it might be reasonable to deduce that a large force had descended upon them. However, that did not explain why there was no sound of a great host outside, and the enemy did not feel that numerous. Then, could they be adventurers? That might explain this strange feeling of attackers who were few in number and possessed great fighting power. He slowly rose to his feet, hanging his weapon at his waist. He put on a chain shirt, which did not take much time to don. Then, he attached a leather pouch with several potion bottles to his belt and tied it in place. Since he was already wearing his enchanted necklace and rings, his preparations were now complete. He flung aside the curtain before stepping onto a central path within the cave. Countless lanterns hung at evenly spaced intervals on the walls, each glowing with a continual light spell. It was bright enough that one could scarcely believe they were in a cave. The light illuminated his entire body. He was tall, but not skinny. The body beneath his clothes was as solid as steel. He had not honed his physique through strength traring, but through live battles. His hair was sloppily cut and thus looked uneven. It looked quite messy. His brown eyes stared keenly forward, and the corner of his mouth was curled up in the beginning of a sneer. His chin was overgrown with stubble that looked like mildew. Although he appeared quite slovenly, his movements were nimble and graceful, like those of a beast. As this man arrived at the entrance which was under attack, another man burst in from the other direction. He seemed quite familiar he was a sellsword from the brigade. As the mercenary saw him, a look of triumph blossomed on his face. What happened? The enemy's attacking, Brain San. The bitterly smiling man Brain responded. I know the enemy is attacking. What I want to know is how many are there. Who are they? Yes. There's two of them, both women. Women. Only two of them. Could it be? Blue Rose. Hmm. Brain tilted his head in what seemed like puzzlement, and then he strode out toward the cave entrance, through which the clamor poured. The strongest adventurer team in the kingdom was called Blue Rose, and it was composed of five women. One of them had been an old lady. She and Brain had exchanged blows, and both sides had come away covered in wounds. He had also heard that the strongest assassins in the Empire were apparently women. Powerful women were not exactly a rarity. Although women had weaker bodies than men, magic could easily cover that gap. And of course, if someone with powerful physical abilities was augmented with equally powerful magic, the result would be invincible. Respect welled up in brain for these opponents, who stood as few against the many. His blood boiled in his chest, a battle lust which resembled a hunger to do battle with mighty opponents. Hmm, there's no need for you to come over. Just make sure you guard the inside well. After giving the sellsword his orders, Brain strode forth toward an unknown yet powerful foe. His full name was Brain Unglaus. Originally, he had been nothing more than an unassuming farmer. However, he was possessed of the natural gift, which was a talent for swordsmanship. With the aid of this talent, he was practically invincible as long as he had a weapon in hand. 
on the battlefield, he had not taken any wounds more severe than a scratch, and he could be described as a fighting genius. Having never known defeat in swordsmanship, he walked an eternal path of victory. Nobody, not even himself, had doubted this. But the kingdom's royal martial tournament had changed the course of his life. At first, he had not joined to win. He had simply intended to let the entire kingdom know of his prowess. His aim had been to leave everyone crushed at his feet. However, he could barely believe the result of that tournament. Defeat. For the first time since he had picked up a weapon, no, for the first time in his life, he had been defeated. The man who defeated him was Gazef Stronov. He was now the kingdom's warrior captain, and the mightiest warrior in the surrounding nations. Before they faced each other, the two of them had swiftly cut a swathe through their respective divisions. However, the intense battle between them used up all the time they had saved. In the end, Gazef had seized victory with the move called the Fourfold Slash of Light. The tale of that struggle was immortalized in song and story. In addition, the ascension of the lowborn Gazef to the position of the warrior captain was proof of how spectacular that battle had been. Even the nobles who detested him could not dismiss him as a weakling. Though the winner was covered in glory, Brain the loser felt as though all his efforts up to that point had gone up in smoke. However, Brain had also learned that the dream of becoming the strongest in the world was not one that only he possessed. It would seem his perspective had been too limited. After retreating into himself for over a month, Brain broke through the despair that would drive anyone to drink, and pulled himself together. He refused employment offers from several nobles, having decided for the first time in his life to strengthen himself. He trained ceaselessly, honing both his skills and his body. He learned about magic and furthered his knowledge. The genius now applied himself like a scholar. Defeat had only made Brain stronger. He did not want to work for nobles because he did not want his talents to rot away. One needs sparring partners when practicing the martial arts. Mere discussions of theory were not enough. In addition, there were vocations that allowed him to fight often and earn a good wage. He did not choose the profitable path of the adventurer because adventurers did not have many chances to kill people. Of course, they fought a lot of monsters, but Brain's ultimate goal was to defeat Gazef. With that in mind, he had to train himself by fighting other humans. Within this limited range of options, Brain chose to join the Death Spreading Brigade. Granted, they were only a band of cell swords, but any mercenary company would do. He had only one aim in mind. That was to wipe away his earlier shame and avenge his defeat with victory. In order to achieve this aim, he need greater skills. Brain was willing to sacrifice anything for a weapon that matched his skills. Magical weapons were very expensive, but he did not seek something as simple as a magic weapon. In the south, far from the kingdom, there was a city in the desert. Stories of blades that carved steel like mud came from there, weapons which were far superior to weakly enchanted magic weapons even without any enchantments of their own. Such swords commanded staggering prices, enough to make one's eyeballs pop out when one heard of them. Those weapons were what Brain wanted. And in the end, he finally obtained a katana. Currently, Brain's abilities had reached their limit. He was quite confident that he could defeat anyone easily, even if his opponent was Gazef. Even so, he did not allow that to get to his head, but continued traring himself without fail. Every time he closed his eyes, he saw that scene again. He saw that scene from the martial tournament, that beautiful battle with Gazef. He had evaded that strike of his which nobody had been able to avoid, and responded with four simultaneous slashes. With no way to imagine himself in defeat, all he could see was the noble form of the man who had beaten him, branded into his mind. 
Brain walked to the entrance of the cave, and the faint smell of blood greeted his nose. The screams had stopped. That meant that all his comrades near the entrance had been slaughtered. Only about two or three minutes had passed. There should have been at least ten cell swords at the entrance. Their orders were to hold fast, to buy time for the others to gird themselves for war. But to think someone had killed all these mercenaries in so short a time. If there's only two intruders, that means their abilities must be around the same level as mine. Brain smiled coldly. As he walked easily forward, he downed a potion from the pouch on his waist. The incredibly bitter liquid flowed down his throat and into his belly. He quaffed another bottle, and a wave of heat expanded from his guts, flowing into every corner of his body. In response to that heat, he could hear his muscles bulging and tightening. This rapid muscle augmentation was the result of the magic contained within the potion. The first magic potion he had drunk contained had the effect of a lesser strength spell, followed by one which bestowed lesser dexterity upon him. There was no need to ingest the potions. They would work as long as a certain amount of the liquid made contact with his body. However, Brain felt that they would be more effective when drunk, rather than applied. Of course, that might have just been a whim of his, but whims like that sometimes gave rise to surprising power. After that, he anointed his katana with an oil. Said oil left a faint bluish-white glow on his blade, before vanishing as it was absorbed into the metal. That oil bestowed the effects of a magic weapon spell upon his weapon, temporarily enchanting his sword with magic and increasing its sharpness. Activate 1, activate 2. In response to those command words, a subtle wave of magical power spread out from Brain's necklace and ring to envelop his body. The necklace of eye was a necklace which protected one's ability to see, granting blindness resistance, dark vision, their compensation, and other effects. There was no point in a warrior having the best weapon if he could not hit with it, after all. A common adventurer tactic was to rob a foe of their vision and finish him off with ranged weapons from a distance. The fact was that Brain had suffered that sort of treatment at the hands of adventurers before obtaining this necklace. After that, he activated an item which could both store and release low-tier spells, the Ring of Magic Bind. The spell it released was one reduced energy damage, lesser protection energy. If there were really only two attackers, then it was worth fully preparing himself to face them. It would be too late to regret not having made the proper preparations afterwards. With that, he was ready. He took several deep breaths, expelling the intense heat brewing within his body. As he was now, brain his body enhanced by various effects was a swordsman who stood at the peak of humanity. He was absolutely confident in his fighting ability, and a savage grin bloomed on his face. Now that I've prepared myself, I hope you'll show me a good time. The further he advanced, the stronger the scent of blood became. Two shapes appeared before him. Oi oi, it looks like the two of you had a lot of fun. Hardly. I don't know if it's because these people are too weak, but they're not filling up the blood pool. The response to Brain's unhurried entrance was that casual line. It might have been because the opposition knew Brain would come at them directly. On his part, Brain had no intention of hiding himself, so perhaps that reaction was only to be expected. As he looked on the intruders before him, Brain slightly wrinkled his brow. I was told there were two women, but one's little more than a little girl, and they're in dresses. Still, Brain cast aside those thoughts, because above the head of that unimaginably beautiful girl hovered an orb that seemed to be made of fresh blood. Don't think I've seen that spell before. Are you two magic casters? Both of them wore dresses, garments that were unsuitable for combat. However, if they were magic casters, he could understand why they did not wear armor. 
I am a divine magic caster who venerates the first of the blood, the divine ancestor Cainabel. TL note, it's Cainabaru, where the implies that he is a god. Also brain mispronounces it. Comma dot. The Shin Sao Kainabel? Never heard of him before, is he some sort of evil deity? That is correct, but he was defeated by the supreme beings. Apparently, he was just a weak event boss, or something. One would expect nothing less of the supreme beings. Brain looked away from the muttering girl and turned his eyes to the woman that looked like a follower. That woman was also a beauty, with full, upthrust breasts wreathed in an erotic musk that tillated the senses. Her white dress was flecked in crimson spots. That implied she was the vanguard. Brain relaxed his shoulders, and then gripped the hilt of his sword. Forget it, I'm ready. I can wait for you if you're not, how about it? The girl looked at Brain in surprise. Then she covered her mouth and laughed quietly. How brave. Will you really be all right by yourself? I don't mind if you call all your friends over. There's no amount of small fry which can hurt you, right? Then I'll be plenty enough. It can't be helped if you don't know how high the stars are, right? Childish thoughts like being able to touch the stars by reaching out for them are best left for a girl with childish sentiments like aura. They're disgusting when you hear them coming from an adult. And why can't such a person exist? What would a little girl like you know about a man's dreams? Brain raised his blade, leveling its tip at the two of them. As she saw this, the girl looked boredly at the ceiling, then forward, and then... Get him. The girl raised her chin, and the woman charged. Her movements were swift as the wind however, even if she moved like the wind, Brain could still cut her easily. Chest 2. As he shouted, Brain brought his katana down with a forceful swing. Filled with a power that could split an armored warrior bodily in two, it raced through the air like a hurricane. Coo. HMPH. That was too shallow, huh? Counter-attacked mid-charged the woman leapt away as she pressed her hand against her chest. The cut started from her left shoulder and ran across her breasts. Brain frowned as he stared at his foe. Part of it was because he could not finish her off in a single strike, but there was something else Brain did not understand. That something was why the woman's shoulder was not bleeding. Her blood should have been spurting out, under normal circumstances. Could it be magic? As that thought ran through Brain's mind, he saw what was happening to the wound under the woman's hand, and he narrowed his eyes. The shoulder wound was slowly healing up. He had heard of certain healing spells which worked quickly, but this did not feel like one of them. That being the case, there was only one answer. His opponent was a monster with powers of regeneration. Her sharp canines were exposed and her red pupils were filled with hostility. She looked almost the same as a human being. As he pondered these facts, Brain finally deduced the true identity of the monster. A vampire. No. Special abilities include fast healing, mystic eyes of charming, life drain, creating spawn through blood drain, weapon damage resistance, cold resistance. There should also be a forget it. There was no need to bother with the rest. With that, he gripped his katana's hilt once more. The woman's eyes went wide, and her red pupils seemed abnormally large. In that moment, a fog suddenly clouded Brains' mind, and he felt favorably disposed toward the enemy before him. However, he dispersed the fog with a quick shake of his head. Mystic eyes, huh? My will isn't weak enough to be affected by that sort of thing alone. Having drawn his sword, Brains' heart was like a sword as well, cleaving effortlessly through regular mind control. The vampire bride bared her fangs to frighten him, but that attempt at intimidation was tinged by her own fear. If she felt that she was stronger, then all she would need to do was charge him without bothering with the scare tactics. 
In other words, she felt that she need to be wary of him after his counter-attack, or perhaps it was because she felt he was a strong opponent. Pretty smart. Still, a beast making a decision like that is little more than instinct. Brain slowly advanced on the vampire bride, who steadily retreated in time with his movements. Brain scoffed in boredom. The vampire bride seemed to think her opponent was taunting her and so she ceased her backwards motion, but instead stepped forward. The two of them were roughly three meters apart. A distance the vampire bride could cover in a single bound. Even so, she did not pounce him, because she feared Brain's abilities. And then the vampire bride smiled and extended a hand. Shockwave. A shockwave rippled through the air towards Brain. Given that this spell could easily dent a suit of full plate armor, it would severely injure Brain who wore only a chain shirt if it struck him. In addition, landing the single spell could change the course of this battle, given the difference in the fundamental physical attributes of both parties. However, the vampire bride's eyes went wide in surprise. Smile after you hit, unless you want me to see through your attack. He was unharmed. Brain's mocking laugh rang out after easily avoiding the invisible shockwave. The vampire bride panicked and stepped back. Originally, she had believed humans to be an inferior species and had looked down on him. However, the look of her face was now one of shock as her assumptions had been disproven. Brain did not show it on his face, but he knew he had to change his tactics now, because he had not expected his enemy to use magic as well. Brain's target was the man called Gazef. He desired to cross swords with him. Therefore, his knowledge of magic was not as great as his knowledge of blades. He did not know the mysteries of magic and had no idea what kind of tricks his opponent would pull next. In the end, the two of them ended up staring at each other. The girl standing at the sidelines was displeased by this deadlock, and could no longer hide her annoyance. A. Tag out. The girl snapped her finger, and the crisp, clear sound made the vampire bride's body shudder. Brain remained still as he watched the vampire bride look away. It was a perfect chance to attack, but Brain did not do so. He shifted his attention from the vampire bride facing him to the girl. She was petite, though the fact that her breasts were full and bulbous seemed quite out of place on her skinny body. Her delicate arms looked fragile enough that Brain felt he could break them if he exerted his full strength. There were many kinds of divine magic casters. Perhaps she was not a melee-oriented cleric, but a spell-oriented priestess, or perhaps she was a bishop, who specialized in spell casting. However, she was asking to tag in so she could fight in person. That implied she was confident of victory even without her vanguard. What that meant as Brain thought about it, he smiled. Doesn't look like a command to a summoned creature. That means she must be a vampire as well. In addition, given the girl's attitude, she must be a higher order of vampire. Monsters' appearances often did not match their actual abilities, so it would not be strange for that little girl's body to possess higher physical abilities than the vampire from just now. In addition, she had observed Brain's formidable combat prowess and still chosen to take the field. In contrast, the vampire bride looked afraid. A mistress who can frighten a vampire. Looks like she'll be a tough foe. I'll need to be on my guard. As he sized up the girl, Brain continued pondering her true identity. Speaking of a vampire's mistress, could she be one of those legendary vampire lords? I heard there was one of them who earned the title of Landfall for destroying a nation. However, the stories also say she was wiped out by the Thirteen Heroes. If she had been beaten by heroes in the past, then his opponent was hardly invincible. Brain tightened his grip on his katana's hilt, slowly shifting into an attack stance. I am Brain Unglaus. 
After Brain identified himself to this mighty foe, the girl reacted in a surprising way. She quirked an eyebrow at him. Feeling somewhat uncomfortable, Brain asked the girl, What is your name? Ah, you wanted to know my name. Cositus might have gotten it right away but I've never looked at people like that before, so it took me a while to get it. My apologies, but you should have just asked me directly. The girl took up the hems of her skirt and curtsied elegantly, like a dancer at a ball. My name is Shaltier Bloodvathlen, and the pleasure will be all mine. That elegant curtsy was directed to a man who stood before her with a drawn blade. He was unsure if she knew she would not be attacked, or if she was confident of dealing with any attack that did come. Judging by her expression, it would seem to be the latter case. Someone like you is nothing to be afraid of. Let me break that self-assurance of yours. Brain stared silently at Shaltier, his eyes keen raises that would terrify even a hardened veteran. Her calmness irritated him, but on the flip side, that expression of hers played right into Brain's hands. It was the arrogance of the strong. This arrogance was one of the weapons humanity could use to defeat monsters, whose power outstripped that of human beings. In fact Brain had played on this sort of opportunity before to defeat several monsters who were mightier than himself. The most important thing was he could mock them after he defeated them. After he told them, you can look down on some people, but not others. Are you not going to use martial arts? Martial arts. They were skills mastered during a warrior's quest for martial perfection. Some people called them ki or some kind of aura, but they defied easy description. In the face of a massive, towering foe, a person who had learned fortress could negate the mighty blows of his opponent and stand blade to blade with him. Someone who had learned the ability to concentrate ki onto his blade and swing with slash could slay even the most resilient of foes in one hit. Against heavily armored foes, the bludgeoning martial art called Bash came into play. Anyone who had learned to temporarily improve their physical parameters with ability boost could seize victory through the power of their augmented bodies. A warrior need to anticipate all sorts of circumstances, learn various martial arts, and incorporate them all into his own strength. This went double for adventurers, who were often plunged into bizarre battle conditions. That being the case, what about Brain? HMPH, I won't need martial arts for a brat like you. Brain responded. It was a lie, of course. He was not stupid enough to announce his ace in the hole to his opponents. Brain exhaled slowly and lowered his stance, returning his sword to its sheath. He was preparing for a draw cut. His breaths became long and shallow. He focused his mind into a single point, and in the moment where it was fully concentrated, his awareness rebounded, expanding back outward. His perceptions were on a level where he was fully aware of everything around him. Sounds, the air, and other sensory phenomena. This move was one of the original martial arts that he had created, field. Its range was not great, only about three meters in radius, but the martial art allowed him to perceive everything within that radius. Perhaps it might be easier to explain it as boosting his accuracy and evasion while within that area. Combined with Brain's honed body, this martial art possessed extraordinary power. He was confident that he could emerge unscathed beneath the hail of arrows. In addition, his precision was such that he could cleave even a tiny grain of wheat in two. In addition, all living things died when weapons struck their vitals. Thus, all one need to do was master techniques which could accurately strike said vitals. Rather than learn a broad range of techniques, he had focused on one single goal. His goal was to strike faster than his opponent, to accurately deliver a single, fatal blow, and in the course of his studies he had innovated a second unique martial art, Instant Flash. 
That high-speed strike was swift enough to be undodgeable, but he had not stopped there. His trawing after that was extraordinary, in pursuit of the peak of excellence. He must have practiced it hundreds of thousands, no, millions of times. His ceaseless use of the instant flash had caused calluses to grow on his palms. Specializing him in performing the technique, and parts of his sword's hilt had been worn into the shape of his grips. In his unending quest for perfection, he had once more birthed a new technique. He could cut his foe so quickly that blood would not even stick to the blade. Feeling that he had reached the realm of the gods, he named that technique, God Flash. With that move, his opponents would not even realize he had struck. Once he combined these two martial arts, the field, which guaranteed a hit and the God Flash, that struck at divine speed, there was no way anyone could avoid being slain in one blow. His strikes were aimed at his opponent's vitals. Specifically, their necks. This was his secret movie. Mogaribue. TL Note, a Magari, is a form of bamboo fence, while the Mogaribue, is the sound of the winter wind blowing through that fence, like a flute. It was named for the sound his opponent's blood made when it spurted from the stump of their severed necks. Against vampires, there would probably be no spray of blood, but being able to sever his foe's neck probably counted as a victory. Are you done preparing yet? As she looked at Brain, who stayed silent and did nothing but breathe, Shaltia shrugged in boredom. I'm ready to make my move, so if you have any last words, feel free to say them. Beat. Then let the trampling begin. Shaltia strode forward with that cheerful pronouncement. Are you kidding me? We'll see how calm you are after your head hits the ground. Brain did not say that. He felt that Junsa would break his concentration and waste his effort. Shaltia's steps were unguarded, seemingly defenseless, as dainty and casual as if she were heading for a picnic. This was not the way a warrior moved. Brain fought the urge to grin. He felt she was foolish, but there was no way he would go easy on her. Brain went on to use ability boost. He was waiting for his opponent to enter his field, which was also his striking range, and once she did so he would attack. Arrogant monsters who thought themselves mightier than others were all like that. After all, humans were weak creatures with inferior physical abilities, and no special abilities of note. However, I'll teach you how dangerous it is to look down on mankind. Brain mused that martial arts were created to fight beings that were stronger than humans. I'll finish you off in one hit. Haughty monsters would often struggle when pushed into dire straits. If he could not finish her off in one blow, she would probably instruct her vampire to come help her. Then the battle would become two against one, and even Brain would be hard-pressed to hold them off. Thus, he need to kill her in one blow. Brain's face was impassive, but he was laughing internally. He laughed at his opponent's leisurely approach. Perhaps she did not know that she was climbing the stairs to the chopping block. Three more steps, two more steps, one more step, and then, your head is mine. With that mental declaration, Brain struck with all his might. Who? He expelled a short, forceful breath. His blade cleared his sheath, slicing through the air at Shaltia. There was a single word to describe the speed of this movement lightning. By the time one saw it, one's head would have fallen, so quickly did it take place. After practicing millions of times, it was truly a divine flash. I win. As Brain thought that, he stared in shock. The blow had missed. The strike into which he had poured his entire being had been evaded. If that had happened, he might have been able to admit that he had met an unimaginably powerful opponent. However, Shaltia had caught it with her fingertips. She had caught Brain's lightning-fast strike. 
In addition, she held his blade gently, like one would the wings of a butterfly. Brain could not help but pant heavily, as he felt the air seem to freeze around him. Im impossible. Those nearly inaudible words accompanied each gasp he made. Brain struggled desperately to rein in the tremors within him, as the scene before his eyes utterly defied his expectations. However, it was an undeniable fact that there were two of Shaltier's ivory fingers upon the body of his blade, her thumb and her forefinger. More than that, she had not seized his blade from the front, but hooked her arm around the swing to catch it from behind. Without once entering the path of the strike, she had caught up with the speed of the katana with the speed of his god Flash. Although she appeared to be gingerly grasping the blade, with hardly any effort at all, Brain could not budge his sword backward or forward, despite pouring the full strength of his body into his exertions. It was like yanking on a chain fastened to a stone several hundred times his own body weight. And then, the force on his sword suddenly increased, almost throwing Brain off balance. HMPH, Cositis has several of these too, but since there's an astronomical difference between the wielders, it's hardly worth being on guard for. Shaltier pulled the grasped katana before her, studying it. As Brain understood what she had said, the inside of his head turned white. It was a sense of despair which denied his entire life. Even so, he pulled himself together again. That was because he had been defeated once, and just as a broken bone would knit back thicker and stronger, he had developed a resistance to the condition of defeat. It was impossible, but he had to believe it. He had to believe the fact that her fingers could easily seize his divinely fast strike. His face nearly turned pale from the weight of that shock, and Shaltier wrinkled her brows in surprise at this development. Then, he heard something like an exaggerated sigh of disappointment. You understand, right? You can't beat me without using martial arts. If you understand, please don't hold back. Shouldn't you go all out now? As those cruel words reached his ears, Brain could not help but curse. You damn monster. As she heard him, Shaltier smiled innocently, radiant as a blossoming flower. Is that so? Do you finally understand? I'm a cold, merciless, cruel and lovable monster. After letting go of the katana, Shaltier leapt back to her original position, accurate to within the millimeter. Are you done preparing yet? Shaltier's delighted smile and those words combined to make Brain's blood boil. How much further are you going to scorn me? Instead, as Brain realized that his opponent was powerful enough that she could look down on someone like him who had reached the limits of human strength, he could not help but be afraid. Should I run? Brain had always felt that living was the most important thing. If he was outmatched, he should run and erase his shame at a later date. Brain felt that as long as he survived, he could claim the victory in the end, because he was sure he could get stronger in the meantime. However, how could he flee someone whose physical abilities overwhelmed his own by such a large margin? As though freshly awakened, Brain reconfirmed the location he was targeting. He was aiming for her legs, to reduce his opponent's mobility before escaping at top speed. He would avoid the radius in which his foe had seized the strike made with all his might, and instead attack something which was harder to defend. With that in mind, Brain turned his attention to Shaltier's neck as he resheathed his katana. When, field, activated, he could strike accurately even with his eyes closed, so it made sense to deceive his opponent with his eyes. Let the trampling begin. Shaltier stepped forward once more in an exaggerated fashion. Although he had previously expected that she would step into his field, it was the opposite now he hoped that she would not enter the field. How pathetic is this brain mentally chastised himself. Still, even his desire to avenge himself could not ignite his fighting spirit. It was like a fire that had run out of fuel. 
HTSKED, and used field to monitor Shaltier's movements. Three steps, two steps, one step. She was in range. As Brain stared at Shaltier's neck, he noticed her mocking expression out of the corner of his eye. His target was the right ankle she was putting forward. He swung down with his katana, using his body weight to further hasten his blow. As he cast his stress aside, he was certain that this swing was faster than the previous one. Even he had no way of defending against a strike of that speed. I can do it. Just as he was about to slice off the girl's delicate ankle that revealed itself from beneath the hem of her skirt, the hilt of Brain's katana slid from his hands. Brain's line of sight did not move, and he had no idea what had happened. However, the special sensory abilities granted to him by Field made him acutely aware that his beloved katana was now on the ground, trod under a high-heeled foot. It was impossible. Yet, it was an undeniable reality. The reason Brain's katana had slipped was because of the shock transmitted into his hands when that high-heeled shoe had stepped on it. There was only one reason not to believe this. That reason was, despite heightening his focus to its limit, he still had not sensed his opponent's movements. Yes, not even within the field of which he was so proud. She was close enough that if she reached her hand out, she could touch him. Shaltier's disdainful gaze landed on Brain from such a short distance. The startling pressure it generated threatened to crush the air along with Brain himself. Brain's breathing grew chaotic. His sweat flowed like rain, soaking his entire body. His field of vision trembled and an intense feeling of nausea came over him. He had been through several risky encounters before, so desperate situations were a common sight for him. However, those encounters were little more than child's play compared to his present predicament. The high-heeled shoe pulled off the blade, and Shaltier silently leapt away. Are you done preparing yet? The third repetition of those words filled Brain with an incomparable sense of despair. Next, she would say, let the trampling begin. Quote, However, just as Brain thought that would happen, he heard something completely different. Could it be that? You can't use martial arts. That voice filled with pity and surprise and made Brain draw a sudden breath. He could give no reply. No, to be precise, he did not know what to say. Perhaps he could playfully reply like a clown. Ah, I used him, just now, but you defeated him easily. Biting his lower lip, Brain retrieved his katana. Could it be that you're not actually that strong? I thought you were stronger than those chaps at the entrance. Sorry about that, I measure strength in meters, so I can't discern differences of a millimeter or two. He had worked so hard and so long. During the showdown with Gazef, he was overly confident in his natural abilities, so he had not trained and lost to someone who had. As a result, his defeat had turned into his motivation. The mindset he had developed, of standing up again from defeat of earnestly honing his skills to produce results were nothing but foolishness to the monster before him. This can't be happening. All along, I've been slaying those monsters who scorned me and mocked me for being weaker than them. As those thoughts rose through Brain's mind, he struggled to press them down, and in their place. A-A-A-H-H-H. With a great shout, he made his move on Shaltier. Brain swung at Shaltier who had a puzzled look on her face as she watched him attack with all the force his body could muster. His blow, which marshaled all the muscles of his entire body, could easily cut an armored human being in half. Shaltier had no intention of evading that stunning strike. The way she watched the gleaming arc of white light descending upon her made Brain think that he might be able to land a hit. However, the scene from earlier denied those thoughts of his. Could he really strike her so easily? In the next moment, those fears were confirmed. 
As a crisp ringing filled the air, Brain once more saw an unbelievable sight. Shaltier had swiftly flicked the nail of her left little finger roughly two centimeters long with blinding speed. In addition, Shaltier did not seem to be using any strength at all. The rest of her hand was balled up into a fist, leaving only the little finger sticking out. And it was slightly bent. With that motion which did not even qualify as toying with him she had parried that blow which Brain had struck with all his might. Parried that blow which could cleave full plate armor, shatter swords, and break shields. Struggling desperately to pull together his shattered wall to fight, he focused his strength into his hands which trembled from the impact of Shaltier's parry. He raised his katana high and brought it down, and then Shaltier still casually deflected it. Wah! Shaltier yawned in an exaggerated manner, even going so far as to pat her mouth with her right hand. She was intentionally staring at the ceiling now. It would seem she was no longer taking Brain seriously. Even so, even so Brain's katana had still been deflected by the little finger of her left hand. You, a roar issue from Brain's throat. No, it was not a roar, but a cry of despair. Horizontal slash parried. Diagonal slash parried. Frontal slash parried. Diagonal cut parried. Vertical cut parried. Horizontal cut parried. No matter the angle, no matter the direction in which he made his attacks, all of them were deflected. It felt as though his katana was being drawn to that nail, and in that moment Brain finally understood. His opponent was truly powerful. Even his hard work and natural talents could not even bring him close to her feet, let alone onto her level. Our retired already. Though come to think of it, this nail clipper's pretty dull. Brain stopped swinging as he heard those surprising words. Could one cut through a mountain with a sword? That was impossible. Even a child knew that. Then, could he beat Shaltier? Any warrior who faced her would know that answer. There was no way he could defeat her. Human beings could not defeat in ties who were beyond human imagination. If anyone was able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with her, that someone must surely be a mighty individual who was beyond the realm of mankind. Regretfully, Brain was merely a warrior who stood at humanity's peak. Indeed, no matter how hard he worked, as long as he was still a human being, he would be nothing more than an infant flailing around with a stick. Trained so hard. Trained hard. What a pointless statement. I was created strong, so there was no need to train too hard in order to become stronger. Brain laughed as he heard this. I tried so hard, and got so far. But in the end, it doesn't even matter. How self-centered was I, thinking I was a genius? His legs felt heavy, like they had been squashed by huge boulders. Ah, what are you crying for? Did something sad happen? He understood what Shaltier was saying. However, her voice was muffled, as though it were coming from far away. Even his determination to train himself, the determination that let him burst the blisters on his hands to continue swinging a heavy iron bar, was meaningless. Wearing heavy armor and running long distances was meaningless. Defeating monsters by himself was also meaningless. It was all meaningless. Therefore, Brain's life was also meaningless. In the face of a truly powerful being, Brain was no different from the powerless weaklings he used to mock. I'm an idiot. Are you done? Then it's about time to wrap this up, no? Shaltia giggled as she advanced on him, her little finger extended. Brain cried out. Not a warrior's call to battle, but a child's weeping. Brain ran wildly. He faced his back to Shaltia. Having experienced Shaltier's physical ability firsthand, he expected that she would catch up with him immediately. Still, he paid that fact no heed. Or rather, Brain no longer had the energy to worry about that sort of thing. 
He simply revealed his defenseless back to her, scrunching his face up into a tear and snot-filled mess as he desperately ran deeper into the cave. Just then, an innocent girl's voice, laced with bloodlust, came from behind Brain.